so. And let's go ahead and move on. So we dealt with the electron homes and our electron orbitals. I guess we'll take a step back there. So when we go through and build our atomic theory of the atom, we've got the nucleus with protons and neutrons, and then we've got our electrons outside it. And at least initially, we didn't really care where they were outside it. We just said they were outside it. Using atomic line spectra, we were then able to say that we do care. There are distinct places or discrete places on where our electrons can exist. Right? There are homes, per se, for each of our electrons. Those then get categorized into certain locations. So the first kind of pass on it is the energy level. Right, so our energy level is shown on the periodic table. Right? Each of the rows is an energy level. So when we look at all the energy levels I got marked out, if we ignore the top one, because the top one is the vacuum, so no longer attached, I can never spell vacuum, so we'll just stick with back. There are seven of them. There are also seven rows on the periodic table. Those seven rows correspond to each of the energy levels. Okay. So you all read the section, right, on it? Okay. You may have spent some time memorizing some facts, and I would argue almost all of the time that you spent memorizing those facts was useless. Okay. Because the periodic table has that information embedded in it. Okay. So let's start with the first fact, potentially. How many electrons fit in the first energy level? Two. 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 How many ele electrons fit in the second energy level? Eight. 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 In the third energy level? Eight. Eighteen. Eighteen. Okay. So I'm kind of happy with that because you don't have them memorized. So that's good because that information is in the periodic table. We don't have to memorize it. Okay, so let's real quickly kind of point out at least the first two. The first energy level holds two electrons. If we take a look at the very first row on the periodic table, there are exactly how many elements? Two. two. In the second row, we have eight. eight elements, corresponding to each of the electrons that you could place into that orbital, okay, or into that energy level. We move to the third energy level, things get a little bit crazy, because when we look at that third row across, how many do we see? Eight. Only eight. And it turns out that we have 18. And the reason we have 18 is because our transition elements, the elements scandium to zinc, are offset by one. We have shown them in the periodic table one row down from where their energy level is. So how many officially are in the third energy level then? 18. There's the 8, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay? So the periodic table holds that. Okay? And that's kind of neat. And one of the questions that can kind of come out was, well, why did you shift it? Okay. Well, the reason we shifted it had to do with how the electrons fill into those orbitals. And we'll see that in a little bit. Because the fill pattern on where we place our electrons has a little bit of wiggle room. And that little bit of wiggle room has to do with kind of a neat concept known as beauty. Right? And how I like to describe them, beauty and the beast. Okay, so we'll evaluate those when we see them a little bit later, but it's coming back to this idea of electron homes and fill patterns. Okay, so we've got our energy levels. The very first energy level, what orbital type do we have? We have the sphere shape, so we have to describe what it looks like. It's a sphere. Okay? If we were going to describe placing an electron there, we could say we're putting it in the first energy level, and then we could write circle. What's the problem with that? Looks like a that looks like a 10, so that's not very fun. So instead of writing the circle, we could bust out our shading and like shade it. That's a bad idea. So we could write sphere. That's going to get tedious really fast, so instead we use S. S. We came up with a symbol to represent. Okay. If I'm going to reference that I've put one electron into that orbital, I could say it placed into the 1S orbital. 
What if I want to say I've placed two electrons into the 1s orbital? Okay. Now I add a 2. That 2 needs to go where I would be counting electrons. Remember when we talked about atomic notation? I said there's a place for where we count electrons. Where was that place? The upper right-hand corner. That was an eraser. Let's try that again. There's our 2. Okay. What happens when we move to the second energy level? Okay. I now get two orbital types. The first orbital type is a copy of the previous energy level. The previous energy level was a sphere. So I've got that one. So if I wanted to talk about placing electrons into that orbital, I can reference it as the S type. But if I just said S type, I don't know where I've placed the electron. Is it in the second energy level or the first? If I'm talking about the second, I need to make sure my notation shows that. How can I make sure it says that? 2. 2S. Make sense? All right. The next energy or the next orbital type that comes out of this, because we have to get a new one, would then be the dumbbell. So we got two answers that came out of that. The dumbbell or the P, because we don't want to bother to write out dumbbell each time. All right. So we could reference that as the 2P. Well, how many electrons could I fit into a single 2p orbital? Six. Anybody want to volunteer anything else or stick in with six? Eighteen. As a hint, you're going the wrong way. Four is better, but also wrong. Two. Two. Doesn't matter the orbital type, and I appreciate the guess. Doesn't matter the orbital type, every single orbital can hold two electrons. Six is a really common answer to that question, because you remember it's P equals six. P does not equal six. That's why a P is an upside down, right? Those th things don't match. So when you're thinking six, what you are referencing is that there's an orientation associated with this. So that when I move up to that new type of orbital, it turns out that there's three versions of it. I can get a different orientation of the dumbbell. And that's where I can align along the y, x, and that's an attempt at z axis. Each of those orientations counts as a new orbital because each orbital, orbital, or, damn, I keep doing it. Each orbital holds two electrons. How many electrons can I fit in the P type? Six. Six. Okay, I like the hesitation there. You know, I, I said I was wrong last time. Okay. The question changed. I said how many fit in the P type versus how many fit in a single P orbital? Okay, what's the difference? One case I said how many fit in this single location? How many fit in this class of location? The single p orbital is referring to one orientation. The p type is now referring to the entire class, which includes all three orientations. Okay. It is a stupidly subtle turn of phrase, and as we'll see in a little bit, it can get even worse. Okay. To somewhat simplify that, we could go through and reference each of our 2p orbitals and how many electrons we could fit in each. Just like we could have done with our 1s. We could have said 1s1, 1s1. That equals 1s2. Why would I simplify it? Because I don't want to write all the junk out. Do I want to write out 2p2, 2p2, 2p2? No. So what do we write out? 2p6. Okay. So this is where you have to be careful to recognize why you're memorizing something and don't oversimplify it. Make sense? At least ish? Ish. Yeah. Ish. That works. Okay. What happens when we move up in energy again? Changes to three. The very first one will be? 
S or sphere. The next one will be P or dumbbell. The next one will be D or cloverleaf. Okay. You're responsible for knowing those one-letter codes, and you're responsible for knowing those shapes. Okay. As we move up to the four, same thing happens. 4S, 4P, 4D, 4F. 5, S, P, D, F, G. You're like, what? There's no G. That's right. We haven't gotten there yet. Okay, we probably won't get there. Okay, but theoretically, there is a G or an orbital type. We just haven't been able to create an atom stable enough to allow for that. Okay, so we will continue to add these on. Okay, that does start to bring in a suggestion, though, particularly as we get closer and closer to each other at the top, the difference in energy between each of those energy levels, orbital types and orbital orientations, now all become really, 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 really small, which means all sorts of weird, goofy things can happen. Those weird, goofy things, for the most part, we can ignore in this class. Okay? In future chemistry classes, you might have to watch out for those. Okay? So before we get into those fill patterns, our electrons, city-state, all that fun stuff. There's some nicer pictures. We've got the S. There's only one orientation for the spheres, so that's all we get. For the P, whoops, whatever. For the P, we get three orientations. Okay. For the D, we get five orientations. Notice on the P, we're alternating off the axes. Okay. If I looked at the D orbitals, it's really hard to see with this because this is a three-dimensional kind of shape. Those lobes are not on the x, y, or z axes. Why not? They would uh, interfere with the p. They would overlap with the p orbitals. Okay. So every time we shift, we're making sure that our orbitals minimally overlap within those orientations. All right, so the rest of the possible orientations with the clover leaf are there. And we can clearly see that those all look like clover leaves because we accept there's four lobes and a clover leaf has four lobes. And we all agree with that statement. You lie. You're telling me you see four lobes in that last one. Okay, don't just agree with me, challenge it. Do you see four lobes? No, no that's not a clover leaf, still a d orbital. What's that one called? It looks kind of like the P orbital, right? So it looks kind of like a dumbbell, but then it's got this weird, goofy, like, circular thing around it. Kind of like a... Yeah, we could use a disc. That's not too bad. But it's got a hole through the middle of it, and most discs don't have holes through the middle of them. Like a donut. We have the dumbbell donut. And you're like, that's a stupid name. That's the name that's picked. <laughs> okay, or it's something like that. I don't even really know. Okay, but that is our last D-type orbital. For the most part, or where you are, will be tested, sphere, dumbbell, cloverleaf. Do you need to worry about the donut? No. Okay? Yes? Uh, for the 2P section, why can't the dumbbell be rotated another one to the clockwise direction, that wouldn't interfere with it. <clears throat> Which one are you talking about for clockwise so, direction? The last one. Rotate. Last one, if I rotate clockwise in the plane of the paper? Counterclockwise. Counterclockwise, what do I overlap onto? The x-axis, which is Windows already shown. What if I just go, so I, I usually wait for that, usually someone asks, what if I just go, I don't know, 45 degrees? Isn't that a different orientation? Wouldn't I be able to see that? Yeah, stop seeing that. There's three axes, x, y, z. Orientation is a hand-wavy approximation of what's happening. Why are they on the x, y, z axis? It has nothing to do with orientation. It has to do with the angular momentum of the electron in its magical spin state. You're even like, you can bring in magic? I just did. You don't want to evaluate the mathematics behind it. Okay? You're looking at probably three more year, years of chemistry and three more years of 
calculus, linear algebra, differential equations to come to explanations to explain why those shapes are the way they are. The orientation model that I give you is just because most people, when I say there's three orientations, go, oh, yeah, three-dimensional space. That would be X, Y, Z. Ta. That's it. Right? It's the easiest way to explain that. Does that make sense? Right? If you want to dig deeper than that, I would say talk to me after class, but I'm going to say no to that because I can't dig deeper than that. Okay? So, you all saw this. First energy level. Our energy sub-level. Okay? So this would be our energy level. I completely agree with that terminology. The textbook uses a sub-level. I would argue that would be the orbital type. How many electrons fit in that orbital type? Okay. Two. Okay. So if I now look at the electrons in my energy level, for the first energy level, it would be two. Thoroughly exciting, right? Okay. Second energy level. What are my sublevels or my orbital types? 2s and 2p. How many electrons fit in the 2s orbital type? How many electrons fit in the 2p orbital type? 6. How many electrons fit in the energy level? 8. The energy level right there is referencing all the way back there. That's the number in front of each of these. Make sense? So for the second energy level, I have to account for both of those sets. Kind of, sort of? Okay. So we could go through and do this for our twos, our threes, and our fours. And we could go through and go, yay, we can count a bunch of electrons. Okay. For the most part, we don't care about the electrons all the way out in the fourth energy level because that involves the f orbitals. Where are the f orbitals? That's the very bottom of the periodic table. I don't want to talk about those. Okay. You might want to because they're radioactive and explosive and do cool things. I don't want to deal with that because that's a safety hazard and I don't want that lawsuit. Okay. So we ignore that for the most part. Okay. If we move into even the 3, we get access to these 3D. We already explained some of the issues with the 3D. That row was offset. The third or the 3D is located in the fourth row, and that's just confusing. Okay? If we go through and look at the fill pattern with electrons on that, it also gets equally confusing. So for the most part, when we talk about in 130, our electron configurations, we're dealing with electron configurations 3P and above. Okay? Which means we'd be looking at what elements? Well, 3P has how many electrons? 16. 2 is 8. 14. 18. What elements are we going to be primarily concerned about with our electron configurations? 1 to 18, not a bad answer. You can do better than that. Argon to hydrogen or hydrogen to argon. Okay. So when it comes to electron configurations, you would better be able to do electron configurations for any one of those elements. <clears throat> okay. If you can't, then you're going to have a hard time on the exam. Okay. So <clears throat> when we go through to build these, our electrons are added into orbital homes. Lowest energy first we pair before finding a new home. So let's take a look at hydrogen. So we've got our nice little picture here, or at least what I think is nice, and I've had several people tell me it's not nice. I would say you could just leave now, but that's also equally not nice. So, Hydrogen has how many electrons? One. Where does its electron go? Okay, one S. So we could write one S. How many electrons? One. Does that notation, 1s, tell me one electron? No, it does not. That just tells me I'm looking at the 1s orbital. 1s, 1. 
In my diagram, ta-da, there's my electron. Nice little line. If I move to helium, how many electrons does helium have? Two. Two, so it becomes 1s1 for one electron, 1s1 for the second electron. That's really repetitive, so we can condense that to 1s2. There's my second electron. Okay? So far, so good? Okay. So let's do osmium. For those of you that are still looking seriously to think that I would ask that, that's very telling. Let's try lithium. Osmium's in the friggin' middle of the periodic table, guys. Come on now. <laughs> A 76 electrons. Give me some credit. Not that mean. Most of the time. Where's the first electron for lithium? 1s1. Next one. 1s1, next one. 2s. Okay, 2s1. I heard a 1s1, that's okay. Look at our periodic table. Hydrogen was 1s1. Okay, first energy level, tick, 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 tick. I can move to helium. So the very next electron that I add is going to be the first energy level. There's that one. Okay, the s is a little bit misleading at this point, but it's a 1s1. To get to lithium, what do I have to do? Move to the next row, which means two. Each of the rows is your energy levels. Find the element in your periodic table in the row. You now know the energy level okay, for its highest energy electron. 2s1. Which column is lithium in? The first column. 2s1. First and one both represent... One, you're like, that was a dumb observation, Mike. It gets better. Maybe. Depends on your definition of better. Beryllium. 1s1, 1s1, 2s1, 2s1. That's a lot of writing out. For those of you that are writing all that out, I apologize. Stop writing it all out and just listen with me. What could we condense that to? 1s2, 2s2. Those of you that are writing can now start writing again because that's better. The outermost electron for beryllium. Which row is it in? Second row, two. Which column is it in? Two. That's starting to look like a pattern. Boron. So 1s1, 1s1, we can start to be like, that's annoying, right? 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. Why did you jump to p? S could only hold 2. There's a big old giant hint that you got to stop using s. See beryllium? See boron. What is between those two? Empty space. Why is there empty space? It's a new orbital. That's it. I have to use a new orbital. So, the birth of the P. Okay. Which column is boron in? Which column is boron in? So we got two. We're still in the second row. We had the giant gulf, which meant new orbital type. Which row is boron in? Third, that's a one. Why is that one? I'm going to make the argument that boron is actually in the first row, or first column, not the 13th column. Uh, not a bad observation, but no. Based off of that block, when we look at this, what do we see a lot of in the periodic table? 
blocks of sphere, but we've got squares, right? And we compile squares together, we get, you know, rectangles or squares or other shapes. Those first two, all the way down, right? Kind of a block on their own. And then scandium down is kind of a block on its own. And then boron down all the way out to neon down is another block. And then down here, we've got another block. So when we look at the periodic table, if we envision and kind of change our interpretation of it, really what we're seeing is this. I said boron was in row one, or column one. Column one of the P block. When we looked at beryllium, it was in column two of the S block. Scandium through zinc are all part of the <coughs> D block. The bottom two are part of our F block. That information is stashed within there as long as you know how to follow those patterns. Okay? We threw out one big hint on going from S to P. There was giant empty white space suggesting we shifted to a different orbital. Okay? Do we get that giant empty white space between calcium and scandium? No, what we have to do is envision the blocks that are dropped in there. If you've got those blocks dropped in there, you can drop your labels on it, and you now know what orbitals those are referencing. What do, you, what do I mean by that? Okay, well, we did boron, <coughs> sulfur. I'm going to argue I'm going to skip 1S2 altogether. Where is sulfur? I'll accept P block, yep. Yeah. It is in the third row of the P block. Which column of the P block? Fourth. What happens to everything beforehand? Fill it up. 2S2. Well, that's supposed to be a 2. 2P6, 3S2. Okay. It's there. You can use that information. Nine times out of ten, the questions that you see in Chem 130 when you're talking about electron configuration are asking about that very last part. So if you know how to identify the very last electrons within your individual elements, you've got your multiple choice answer done. It's the easiest and quickest way to interpret your question. Okay. The rest of them just need to get filled. That does mean you have to know the sequence in there. Do you have to memorize that? No. no. It's, the it's also embedded in the periodic table. You would have to stepwise out through it, but it is already there. Okay? Make sense? Okay, so what if I said cobalt? You're like, well, you would be talking about a metal supposed to be a joke. It's quite all right. We'll just let that accept. Okay, maybe somebody at home when they watch the video starts laughing. <laughs> the raw, horrible silence. Cobalt. Okay. We had turd suge two turd suggestions. <laughs> Three. <laughs> At 4D, both of them suggested 7. Okay, too late. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Cobalt. Which column? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 of the D block. So it should have that 7 as a superscript. It is part of the D block deciding whether it's 3 or 4. Becomes tricky with the D block because the D block is offset by 1. So even though it is in the fourth period, it technically belongs in the third. Why would we do that? If I put scandium in the third block, what happens? I go from magnesium with 12 to scandium with 21. Does that counting make any sense? No. So why do we offset it? So the counting makes sense. Yes? Yes. 
Uh, we have to offset it because when does it come in? Okay, numerically in that pattern. The third energy level brings in three orbital types. The fourth energy level brings in four types. I know where you're trying to go with that. Stop. That's what it does. Okay. The rest fill up. What's the orbital right before the 3D? I want to know what goes right there. Because I'm pretty sure you can tell me over here. That's the 1S2, right? I want to know that guy. What's in that? So that's saying calcium right before our scandium, because we did all of the Ds. So there's our 7. We're counting backwards. 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. The next one is? The fourth row, second column of the S block, and that becomes 4S2. Okay? Notice, and if we continue to go backwards, the very next one is going to be 3P6. We're jumping from 3 to 4 to 3. That doesn't seem to make numerical sense to us. It fills that way. That's why we set up the periodic table this way. So we don't have to memorize it as long as we know that D block is shifted. We memorize one fact, we get it all. Or we memorize a lot more facts and screw them up. Make sense? Ish. Okay. So, can we break you? Here's our filling diagram. You may see something like this. I thought this was the coolest thing ever when I first saw it. Like, oh, I can totally fill. So I just write them all out, and then 1s. And it's like sewing, 2s. And it makes perfect sense, 2p3s, 3p4s. Oh, it's just perfect. It's beautiful. It's awesome. Then I try to write it out. This is so easy. I don't know why anybody would have any problems with this. What ends up being the problem? Straight line. Straight line. Straight line. Straight line. Not a straight line. Horribly not. Oh, but I got straight again. What happens is you try and stitch back and forth if you can't keep them in a straight line. It all goes to hell and you screwed up the whole system. The periodic table is lovely. Use the periodic table. Okay. If you don't want to use the periodic table and you can write in straight lines, do it. Good for you. You're better than me. Okay. But you will see that. You could use that. The next big part, so let's try it this way. How many of you tried watching the Lewis structure video? Hey, good. Bravo. <laughs> the big kind of concept that's dancing on that video that you really need is this term, valence electrons. Okay? If I look at carbon's electron configuration, 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. Yes, you should be able to draw them that fast. Which of those electrons is most likely to interact with another element? 2p2. 2p2. Why? Why is it the furthest away from the nucleus? What about 2p2 makes you go it's further away? The orbital. You're like, it's the last one. Do more. It's not the orbitals. To a first approximation. What is that to? The energy level. That's the energy level. So you're suggesting 2p2 is the highest energy level, and that's why it's the furthest away. Isn't 2s2 also part of that same energy level? Does it start with the number 2? Is it part of the same energy level? Yes, it is. Which means when I look for the valence electrons for carbon, it has four valence electrons. Okay. So I can get it from my electron configurations. I write out the electron configuration, find the energy level that's the highest, and I use the number sum of all those electrons. Right? Anybody want to draw out a whole bunch of electron configurations? No. no. Okay, I wish there was a better way. Carbon. Four valence electrons, remember. Fourteen. 
What do you see above carbon? We see the number 14. Uh, 14 is kind of like 4, but with 10. Why would there be an extra 10 there? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. What happens if you subtract the d orbital numbering from your 14? You get 4. And for those of you being like, that's just some magic numerical logical nonsense. What is next to the 14? The Roman numeral for? 4. Referencing the number of valence electrons. Sweet mother, you've got to be kidding me. Fluorine has how many valence electrons? I hadn't even finished drawing the electron configuration. How did you do it so fast? You look the number on top. Well, maybe the valence electrons tell you you're wrong. 1s2, 2s2, 2p, it's in the fifth row, 5. I get a whopping 7 valence. That's exactly what you had in there. Do I need to use the electron configuration? No. I can pull the number right off the top of the periodic table, off the column for the periodic table. Because you'll notice for silicon, how many valence electrons is silicon going to have? Well, there's no magic number right above silicon. How's our periodic table organized? According to families. That reactivity, those patterns in reactivity that we see within the periodic table are grouped because when we're talking about reactivity, we're talking about how one atom interacts with another atom. What's the most likely thing to interact between two atoms? The electrons. It's our electron configurations that are now dictating those familiar patterns within families. That's why we get those connections. It's not because sodium, lithium, and potassium were magically grouped together. It's because their outermost electron shells all have a single electron in them. And that single electron is located in an s orbital. All of that means their chemistry is identical. That's why they're grouped that way. Science. Thank you. I at least got, uh, hmm. OK. So our periodic table, there we go. S block, D block, P block, F block. Hydrogen and helium are tricky. They're tricky throughout the semester. Okay, they're just kind of weird. If you go into the look at the periodic table in the, the thing where I hold office hours, the Tudor Center, you look at their periodic table, you will see that there's a giant white bar disconnecting hydrogen and helium from the periodic table. Okay, and that's because their properties are kind of similar to what's underneath them, but also kind of not. So they kind of mess with the whole system. Okay. Kind of, sort of? Sort of, kind of. That was a good response. So, not a quiz. So let's go ahead and look at this. Uh, four, we're not turning this in, so don't be tearing stuff out. Four minutes. That's a minute per question. Roughly an exam length. First answer, I got two. I got 2.53. I got a 2.53. There was a two something. Oh, it was two three. Okay, I did hear that. Two point. I think I heard a four three. Do you guys really like that three or something, or is that me? Is it just me? Okay. Maybe I'm just not listening very well. Which of these is the best answer? I'm already all of them. All of them are perfectly acceptable. You're following a trend. You've got the idea. It should be getting larger. Okay. Is one perhaps better than another? Okay, why? What are you using to assess and say that one of those answers is better? You're looking at a difference between the previous ones. So up here we went up by 0 0.44. 0 0.34, if I remember right. So it's going down a little bit, right? So maybe the next one should go up by by 0.24, so 1.87 plus 0.24, one, did I, did I do that right? Yeah. Wow, look at that, 0.211, so you're all wrong, no, you got the right idea, okay, 
depending on the level of the question, you may, be, you may want to have to go through and add that layer of detail to explain why your answer is there. Okay, so on a multiple choice test, I would not give you all four of those answers. You might get two, you might get one, you might get 0.43. Okay. In a show your work, how could I make this a show your work question? Let's say write down the trends. Really by doing that, I'm telling you that you need to be looking deeper. Uh, that's way too nice of me. One word. You could even make it three words if you wanted to be more grammatically correct, I guess. Explain your answer. Okay. With that simple addition, it now can become a show your work. You have to explain why you picked the number that you did. If I look at those numbers, 2.11 makes more sense to me. I'm going to have a hard time understanding why you picked 2.53. You can explain it, and that's fine. Okay, but you need to provide that explanation, that secondary evidence. Make sense? Okay. How many electrons fit in one p orbital? Remember that trap where we all shouted out six before? One p orbital holds two electrons. How many electrons fit in the p orbitals? Six. Okay, I switched the question just for those of you. I wasn't doing question two. How many electrons fit in the p orbitals? Six. six. What changed about my question? The s and the presence of one. So if we want to be really kind of poetic about it, one letter changed the answer. One letter. Okay, changed the answer. You have to read your questions carefully. I admit I'm not a fan of that question, but I know that question shows up. Okay, it is a commonly asked question, and it really zeroes in on that or pushes that. Okay, how many electrons fit in the d orbitals? Damn it, Mike, you didn't actually say. Where's the, where's the p block? Far right, boron to neon. How many columns in that? Six. Six. What was the common answer that everybody shouted out for that one? Six. Six. Why? The six electrons fit in the P type. How many electrons fit in the D orbitals? You didn't draw all those out. How many columns are in the D block? Ten. How many electrons? Ten. Ten. We never talked about the F orbitals. In fact, we entirely ignored them. How many electrons fit in the F orbitals? 14. How many different f orbitals are there? Seven. Uh, that caused a little bit more of a pause. Seven. Each orbital holds two electrons. So if I've got 14 electrons, divide by the two possible in each, and I get my seven orbitals. Whew. Neat. <laughs> well, that's not neat. Yeah, I think that's kind of neat. Okay. Why does atomic radius increase down a column? More electrons, right? That's the answer. You're sticking with it. Tough, bananas, all that fun stuff. Why does the atomic radius decrease from left to right? Left to right, what happens to the amount of electrons? You get more electrons. So you're explaining down a column by saying more electrons. But when I look across a row, I get more electrons and I don't get bigger. Your theory, unfortunately, sucks. Okay. And it's not so much that it sucks, it's that you're missing some layers of information. What were those layers of information that we just talked about? We didn't talk about the protons. What did we just talk about? The energy levels, which are referencing, uh, not quite indirectly, the locations of our electrons. When I go down a column from hydrogen to lithium, yes, I'm increasing the number of electrons. That's not what's causing the size to change. Where's the outermost electron for hydrogen? The second energy level. Outermost electron for hydrogen. Oh, the first energy level, where's the outermost electron for lithium? The second energy level, what's the difference between your energy levels? That's what's dictating your size difference. 
Because when we're going down a column, we're going into higher energy levels, we're getting further from the nucleus. It's getting bigger. Okay? So it's not more electrons. It's higher energy levels. That I promise those words show up there. Higher energy levels. Okay? What about across a row or in a period? Okay? Amount of electrons. So when we go left to right, I increase the electrons and I get That's not it. That's not it. Oh, yeah, backtrack, backtrack. Good, good call. Okay. More orbitals. Down a column, the biggest deal is we're jumping in energy levels. Those energy levels are big differences. What's happening to the energy level across a row? It stays the same. Okay. So we'll use fancy words and say static energy level. Which means when I go from lithium to beryllium, yes, I'm adding an extra electron, but where is that extra electron going? The exact same energy level, which means what happens to the distance between the nucleus and that electron? Same. Stays the same. And for people shaking their heads, well, but it doesn't stay the same. You're right. We didn't finish. And what else changes? When you add more electrons, the attraction gets weaker. No. Actually, if you add more electrons, the attraction gets weaker, so that's not quite right. What else is changing? The number of protons. I've now made the nucleus a stronger magnet. I'm placing my electron at the exact same distance away, but now I have a stronger magnet. What is that going to do? That's going to suck it in. So it's because we have the exact same energy levels and a stronger nucleus. Down a column, yes, I have a stronger nucleus, but the energy level changes. The energy level is enough to overcome that stronger nucleus. That's why we don't have to bring that in. Neato. Okay? So, if we go back to our atomic radius, there's our trends. Yay! And we now have an expl explanation for them. There are two ways, and it's unfortunate that I advanced the slide because I just deleted those explanations. Okay? There's two ways atomic radius gets tested. Number one, do you know the trend? Do you know the trend? Okay, you may not know it yet, but next Thursday when I ask, do you know the trend, you will tell me yes. Okay? So that's one way it gets tested. Do you know the actual facts? Okay, the other way it gets tested is, do you know why the trend? Okay. The why the trend versus what the trend. Which is harder? Why. why. Do I expect everybody in here to get the why? No. Okay. I do not expect you to get everything that comes out of my mouth. This is why I will repeat things. I also expect that not everybody wants an A-plus in the class. Okay? So we will go through the why to put it out there. It's up to you to decide if you want those points or not. Can you still get an A without knowing the why? Yes, almost undoubtedly. Okay? But it's going to be a larger impact on you because you have to memorize more. Good? I think that's kind of fair in my mind. Okay. So, unfortunately, the concept of electronegativity, for whatever reason, is not in your textbook. Okay. What electronegativity is referencing okay, is the ability for an atom to take bonding electrons from another atom. This is arguably the most important concept in chemistry, and it is appallingly missing from the textbook. 
right? So if I take two atoms and I bring them near each other where they're forming a bond, I can now predict something about where the electrons in that bond are going. That can give me an idea of how that molecule or how that bond will react and interact with the outside world. Right? That's pretty huge. There are trends to the electronegativity. These are trends, not guarantees. Fluorine is the most electronegative. Francium slash cesium is the least. Notice the arrows that we could drop on our periodic table? Kind of look like the arrows that we could deal with when looking at atomic radius, right? Okay, in fact, I think atomic radius goes the opposite direction, though. Oh, dang, you mean we've got trends going opposite directions? Yeah, that would make it really hard to memorize. Unless you memorize it for the first five minutes of the exam, and in those five minutes, what do you do? You draw the freaking arrows on your periodic table so that you no longer have to memorize it and get them confused. Please do so. Okay? Because what you will have to do is use and manipulate that information. If you don't know the information outright, you can't use it. You have to memorize more. Okay? So, ionic charges. This is kind of coming from the concept of electronegativity. Okay? Iso means equal or same. Electronic is referring to electrons. So when we're talking about isoelectronic, we're saying two atoms have the same electrons. That's it. Okay? So let's pick neon. How many electrons does neon have? Rhymes with pen. Ten. ten, thank you. How many electrons does fluorine have? Does not rhyme with ten. Nine. 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 See, I was right. Okay. Are those isoelectronic? No. no, why not? There's not the same number. How would I make it isoelectronic? An isotope would change the mass, which would change the Charge. neutrons or protons. If we change the neutrons, yes, that's fine and dandy. That's not affecting the number of electrons, so it's not isoelectronic. If we change the protons, that would change the charge, but would I have fluorine anymore? No. no, so I can't change the protons. The only thing I can change are the electrons. How can I make those two have the same electrons? I could add an electron to fluorine, which would make its total 10. Would it be fluorine anymore? No, because what is fluorine? Nine protons, nine electrons. We've now created a new species. This isn't a new element because it's the same number of protons, but it's a different reactivity of that element. I want to draw attention to that difference in reactivity, so I will name it something different while at the same time holding the core values of what makes it fluorine, fluorine. So that's F. Okay. So there's a suggestion that's a good idea, referencing maybe the charge. And I heard a 1 plus. That's a neat idea. Why would you say 1 plus? You added an electron. Why would it be 1 minus? Because electrons are negatively charged. Remember when we talk about knowing all those charges and all that fun stuff? And you're like, that's just a fun fact. I don't need to worry about it. You have to apply it right here. If you don't know those facts, you can't apply them appropriately, and you're going to screw all of this up. Okay? That actually needs to be F minus. And those are saying, well, it's not that big of a deal. It's a really easy mistake to make. Okay? The reason it's an easy mistake to make Because of that, when are you like, yippee, my life is the greatest thing ever? When you're really negative or when you're in a really positive mood? Positive. Oh, crap. Anytime you see a negative, life just got miserable. Okay? Same thing happens in chemistry. When we're dealing with electrons, we have to be very careful with them because they are 
negative. So we have to be careful to address how they see the world and how they interact with the world more carefully to deal with that. Okay. If we push this a bit further, we just said 10 electrons for neon, five or 10 electrons for the fluoride ion, F minus. And we could go out and draw out their electron configurations. Do we have to? Not really. Do you want to? No, okay, then we won't. They're the same. Because they have the same number of electrons. That's what they're referencing when we say isoelectronic. The big reason we bring this up is because this concept of ionic charges. And we look at this periodic table, and it admittedly has some problems with it, so we'll fix some of those. What do you see is interesting about this periodic table? Right? With some of those elements, you see some positives and negatives. What do you think those positive and negatives are referencing? The charge and the amount of electrons it needs to get to the gas. The charge on those individual elements. And in fact, it's the common charge. It is so common that if these elements become charged, guess what that charge is? That charge. What does that mean to you? Not math, not yet. You have to memorize it. Remember how I said there's elements? You had to memorize those names? Here's more information. You can just start layering on it. Okay? You have to memorize that fluorine will carry a minus one charge. So when I see fluorine in a compound, it's minus one. When I see oxygen in a, minus, in a compound, it's minus two. Minus two. Okay? When I see cadmium in a compound, it's plus two. When I see copper in a compound, here we go, right here, focus. Copper in a compound, it's? Plus one. Do you see the charge? Why not? It changes. <clears throat> if it changes, should you memorize it? No. You'll need some other context to tell you what the charge is. You don't memorize those. Okay? So this is where it becomes important. You have to have these memorized. The ones that you don't have memorized, you have to specify. So what does that mean? If you don't memorize any of these, you start to specify all of the charges all of the time. And guess what? Even if you're correct, you're wrong. Okay? Nomenclature. That's what you'll start after exam one. All right, so these charges need to be memorized. Excepting for zinc, cadmium, and silver, there's an awesome little trend that you can use for these. All right. How many of you have given the opportunity, someone came in, a little fairy grandmother, and said, you're part of the nobility, would be like, nope, don't do that. I want to live my life in poverty instead. What do we think? No, everyone's going to say, yes, do that? Cool. Same thing happens with our elements. Our elements can be given that opportunity to look like the noble gases. So put in the proper circumstance, they will immediately try to do that. Can they change their number of protons to look like a noble gas? No, because that changes the identity of who they are. Could change the neutrons. So that doesn't really do much. You're just going to make me lighter or heavier, but that's it. That's not really exciting. Okay. Or we change the electrons. The electrons are effectively our clothing. And for all of you saying, well, that's not that big a deal, how many of you spend a significant amount of money on nice clothes? Okay, or nice technology? Okay, or nice virtually anything? Why are you doing that? For the most part, it's not because you're like, I've got the money. Right? I want those nice things. Why do you want them? Because somebody told you you wanted them so that you look cooler. Yeah, it sucks. We all do it. Okay, same thing's happening up here. So we're going to change our electrons to look like the nobility. Fluorine has nine electrons. How many electrons does it need to look like neon? One. One. It could also look like helium, because helium's a noble gas. What would fluorine need to do to look like helium? Lose a bunch of electrons. How many electrons would it have to lose? It would have to lose seven. It could also look like argon. Gain nine. I've got three options to look like a noble gas. Which of those three options am I going to opt for? Plus one. I'm going to choose the one where I only have to gain 
one electron. That's pretty easy. If I gain one electron, what charge do I become? Negative. Negative one. Because fluorine is in a family, guess what all the elements underneath do? Same. The exact same thing. And you could go through and test that and prove that. If we move to chlorine, to look like argon, what does it need to do? <laughs> Gain one. To look like neon? Chlorine, lose. Seven. seven. Krypton? Gain nine. Gain nine. Which is easier? Gain one. Chlorine's a negative one. Jump to nitrogen. What does nitrogen have to do to look like neon? Plus three. Plus three electrons. It starts with seven. Neon has ten. Plus three. To look like helium? Minus four. Minus four. To look like argon? Twelve. Plus twelve. I have a hard time with those sevens, too. That's not 12, is it? Whatever. It's a number greater than 3. Which is easier? The 3. The 3. Okay, so let's just ignore that one altogether. Okay. Lose, gain 3 or lose 4? Gain 3. Gain 3. What charge does it become? Negative 3. Negative 3. Carbon, you'll notice, isn't on this list. I wonder why that is. Let's use this analysis to look at carbon. Right? To look like neon, what does it need to do? Gain four electrons. To look like helium, what does it need to do? Carbon is six. Helium is two. Six minus two? Four. It would need to lose four. Argon, too far down. I don't want to count that high. Which is easier, lose four or gain four? Okay. It's the same. Which means what happens with carbon? It can go either way, which means it has multiple charges, which means we don't memorize it. Right. What happens on the far end where we get our positives? Take a look at lithium. Lithium has how many electrons? Three, awesome guess. Helium has two, amazing. Neon? 10. For lithium to look like helium, what must it do? Lose 1. For lithium to look like neon, what does it have to do? Gain 7. Gain 7. Which is easier, lose 1 or gain 7? Lose, lose, lose 1. So its charge should be negative 1 because it lost 1. No, the charge is a positive 1. Why? It lost 1 negative charge. electron, which is negatively charged. If I lose a negative, I become... Uh, positive. I don't have to memorize these because it's on the periodic table. If I remember, everything wants to look like the nobility. I just have to remember my own selfish tendencies. You aren't selfish? Memorize. Okay? If you are selfish, welcome to the world. Okay? Chapter 4, summary. These are all the cool scientists, the subatomic particles, wave nature, orbitals. These are all the big concepts that come out of Chapter 4. You need to know them. Chapter 5. These are all the big concepts that come out of Chapter 5. Okay? A couple of these we're going to eliminate right now. And by a couple, I mean one. We talked about chemical physical properties. We talked about the radius. And we just talked about ionic charges. The only one we're going to skip is the ionization energy. We'll deal with that after the exam. Okay? So that is Chapter 4, Chapter 5, Parts of Chapter 3. Parts of chapter 1, and we'd be like, well, cool, we got an entire lecture period where we can practice and study, except we have chapter 12, which is now how do we take molecules and we put them together. Right? In the process of putting them together, we create new things. We create compounds through a bond. So we would classify those compounds according to the types of bonds found within them. We get two primary categories, ionic bonds and covalent bonds. Okay, we will further subdivide those later, keeping it simple for the moment. Ionic bonds. We know we have an ionic bond because metal and a nonmetal. How do you know you have a metal? You know you have a metal. It's on the left-hand side of the staircase. Remember those initial things we talked about, like week one? They come back. 
right? You need to know that information. Covalent bonds are now any two nonmetals. How do we know we have nonmetals? Right-hand side of the staircase. Just to give you an idea of reactivity behind these, if I take a look at sodium chloride versus water, do I expect different chemical properties? Yes. Okay. Why? The bond in sodium chloride is? Ionic. The bond in water is? Covalent. We get a different type of interaction. We expect different properties to come out of those. Just to get at the idea behind covalent bonds and how there are differences there as well, here's another covalent bond compound, HCl. H2O versus HCl, are those both equally reactive or unreactive? Somebody's got some experience with HCl. You gotta. I live in Arizona, a bunch of people have pools. You add chlorine to those pools to make muriatic acid, HCl. That burns. That's, what makes That's not pleasant. That's what makes that acid. Yeah. Okay. H2O, on the other hand, I can shower with that, and that's not a problem. If I showered in hydrochloric acid, I probably wouldn't be here anymore. Okay? They're both covalent bonds, but the aspects of those covalent bonds change a little bit, which means we change the chemistry and in our interpretation of them. Okay? So, ionic bonds, big deal, positive and negative. We can't refer to things as positive anymore because that's not sciencey enough, so we refer to them as cations. Why cations? Because cats are positive. <laughs> yes, thank you for groaning. Negative, it's not mine, I promise. Negative charge are anions because an means not, I don't know. Anions. Okay? So when we're looking at ionic compounds, they're very regular crystal lattices, alternating charges all the way around. Why would we alternate charges? Why would I put a positive next to a negative? To easily make a neutral. To balance out the charges. I don't want negative next to negative. It puts too much charge in the same spot. Okay, we want that alternating charge, okay? which jumps us then straight like leap bounds and whatever's you want to into the Lewis structure video. The Lewis structure video is largely talking about covalent bonds. We can apply it to ionic bonds. Okay? A lot of people, or at least some people, have had chemistry before this class. You all are screwed. Those of you that have not had chemistry, follow my freaking rules. The rest of you that have had chemistry have 99% of the time been taught incorrectly. Okay? And you've been taught incorrectly because general chemistry instructors don't need to talk about Lewis structure. So they don't want to deal with the harder concepts like resonance because it's a hard thing to deal with. Right? So they create some hand wavy rules to skip over and ignore that concept. If you follow these rules, they work. When? All of the time. I have not found a single example that these rules fail on. Okay? They are exceptionally accurate and they are subtly different from every other method out there. Follow the rules, you will get the correct answer. Okay? With that, we'd end up applying it out to shape summaries. Both of those concepts are in the Lewis Structure video, which you guys can watch over the weekend. When we come back on Tuesday, we'll start working through examples of Lewis Structure to really try and beat that into your head so you got it unlocked for the exam on Thursday.